Okay, so today we're going to talk about pleural disease. So we'll start with this case. So when we look at this chest radiograph, what do we notice? Looks like the right diaphragm is elevated, uh, but another thing that's important to notice is notice where the peak of the left diaphragm is here. Here it looks like the peak of the right diaphragm is displaced slightly laterally. And when we look on the lateral view, we notice here is the left diaphragm. Here's the right diaphragm, but back here, there's a small meniscus sign here, or there's blunting of the posterior costophrenic angle. This is a patient with the right pleural effusion. In the upright position, the pleural fluid can come underneath the lung, giving you a subpulmonic effusion. And the way you can differentiate that from an elevated diaphragm is that the peak of the diaphragm is displaced slightly laterally when you have a subpulmonic effusion. So here the effusion is confirmed on the CT scan. Another way, of course, we can demonstrate a pleural effusion is with a lateral decubitus view as demonstrated here. So the blackness of the lung should go out to the edge of the ribs. But if we have a free-flowing pleural effusion and we place the patient in the decubitus position with that side down, we can see the fluid layering against the chest wall. And here's an example where the patient has a pneumoperitoneum, so you can see where the diaphragm is supposed to be. And when we have a subpulmonic effusion, we can see that it displaces the peak of the diaphragm laterally. So on CT, differentiating effusion from ascites, an effusion, of course, here shows up posterior to the diaphragm. Ascites will be anterior to the diaphragm and will interface with the liver. Now, what about this case? Here it looks like the patient has this irregular shaped mass, but we notice that, especially on the lateral view, it seems to overlie a fissure here. So here we need to be suspicious about loculated fluid within the fissure, which we call a pseudotumor. And here on the CT scan, it's easy to demonstrate that this is fluid attenuation and lies within a fissure. And when the fluid goes away, the tumor goes away. So that is a pseudotumor. So a pleural pseudotumor represents pleural fluid collection within the lung fissure. Almost always, this is a transudative effusion. So we can see this with congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, or renal failure. Commonly, we can see it along the minor fissure or along the major fissure at times also. So this is fluid that is loculated along the fissure. When it's along the minor fissure, it tends to have this typical biconvex shape as you see here, but on frontal and lateral views, it changes in shape as it conforms to the shape of the fissure. And that is a clue that you are dealing with a pseudotumor. Here's another example. And when the fluid goes away, the tumor goes away. So this is just loculated fluid within a fissure. And often when we have a pseudotumor, there's also evidence that we have pleural effusion. You may see blunting of the costophrenic angle and some pleural fluid along the lateral chest wall. CT can be helpful. Uh, if there are questionable cases, because here we can demonstrate that it is within the fissure and it is fluid in attenuation, and commonly there's also pleural fluid elsewhere also. Pleural effusions can be divided into transudates and exudates, uh, and so we're all familiar with this. Uh, transudates occur from abnormal hydrostatic or oncotic pressure. The pleura is normal. However, with exudates, you have abnormal pleura, so the protein will be elevated within the pleural effusion. LDH will be elevated also within the pleural effusion. There are many causes of pleural effusions. Just listed some of the causes here. Now, what about with <coughs> congestive heart failure? Most commonly, Pleural effusions are bilateral when we have congestive heart failure, but if we have unilateral pleural effusion, what side is more common with congestive heart failure? With the old teaching here was that if you had unilateral pleural effusion with congestive heart failure, it was almost always right-sided to the point where if you had an, a, uh, an isolated left effusion, then it was taught that that could not be caused by congestive heart failure, where it turns out that that conventional thinking is wrong. 
In this uh, study where they looked at pleural effusions associated with CHF, in most cases, of course, they are bilateral. But if they're unilateral, really they can occur on either side. It turns out that the older studies where they talked about unilateral right effusion uh, being associated with congenital heart failure as opposed to unilateral left, those patients were probably in biventricular failure. And with biventricular failure, you're also more likely to get ascites because of the right heart failure there. And ascites is more commonly associated with right pleural effusion than left pleural effusion. So the point is you can have unilateral pleural effusions on either side in patients who have congestive heart failure. Pneumonias, of course, can also be associated with pleural effusion. And in this example here, if I ask you what is the cause of this pleural effusion, if we look carefully, we can see that there's some nodularity here, uh, thickening and nodularity of the pleural surface. So when we see that, we need to consider malignancy and the differential diagnosis. If it's unilateral, will be metastatic disease and malignant mesothelioma. So both of those would be in your differential in a case like this. If I show you this case, patient with an isolated left effusion, what is the cause? We look here in the abdomen and we notice that here's the pancreas this is this large pseudocyst this is a patient with pancreatitis who has developed this loculated pleural effusion on the left side so the pancreas extends over to the left so patients with pancreatitis that tends to irritate the left diaphragm hence left pleural effusions are more common than right effusions associated with pancreatitis so pancreatitis tends to be associated with left-sided pleural effusions. Here's a patient with pulmonary embolism, and it's common to have pleural effusion also associated with pulmonary embolism. So atelectasis and pleural effusion are actually the most common chest radiographic findings associated with pulmonary embolism. So here is a patient who has a large right pleural effusion. When we look in the abdomen, we notice ascites. We notice the liver is small and has nodular liver surface. So this is a patient with cirrhosis. So in patients who have cirrhosis and portal hypertension, they can develop ascites and can also develop pleural effusions. More commonly right-sided, this is called hepatic hydrothorax. So in patients with ascites, it's more likely to get right effusion than left effusion because there are communications between the peritoneal space and the pleural space, and those communications are uh, more often right-sided than left-sided. Here's a patient who has a large pleural effusion and also has a pelvic mass. This is a female patient. So this is an entity which is called Meg syndrome. So Meg syndrome is when we have ascites and hydrothorax associated with a benign ovarian tumor and the pleural effusion and ascites will resolve after tumor resection. It's usually a transudative effusion caused by lymphatic flow of acidic fluid across the diaphragm or through diaphragmatic defects. Again, more commonly right-sided, although in the example that I'm showing here, it is left-sided. So the typical tumor is an ovarian fibroma or fibrothecoma here. And uh, cites within the pelvis or within the abdomen uh, is caused by transudation of fluid through the tumor tumor surface in excess of the resorptive capacity of the peritoneum. So basically we have ascites benign ovarian tumor associated with pleural effusion. We call this Meg's syndrome. Here's a patient who presents the emergency room with chest pain, has this lobulated opacity here on the left side. There's no history of trauma. First thing we need to consider here is a loculated pleural effusion and what would cause something like that? Well, we need to worry about empyema. In a case like this, on the CT scan, we see this loculated pleural fluid. We see some pleural thickening uh, with some slight pleural enhancement here. So here we would be concerned about empyema. So empyema typically involves in three stages. We have the exudative stage, the fibropurulent stage, and the organization stage. So in the exudative stage, we have pneumonia contiguous to the visceral pleura that results in inflammation of the pleura and accumulation of sterile fluid. So 
at this point these lab values if you tap the pleural fluid will be normal this does respond to antibiotics and so diagnostic thoracentesis is recommended if we have an effusion associated with pneumonia that layers at least one centimeter on the cubitus views when we get to the fibropurulin stage now we have bacteria within the pleural effusion we get fibrin deposition and you can have a complex effusion here so when we look with ultrasound we can see the septations within the pleural fluid now if you tap the effusion these lab values here will be abnormal the organization stage this is when we have a chronic pleural effusion fibroblasts now grow into the exudate from the visceral and parietal pleura that can form a thick pleural peel here that can encase the lung and also uh, at this stage the uh, it is possible for the effusion to drain spontaneously or for the empyema to drain spontaneously through the chest wall we call that empyema necessitans uh, and also at this point patients can also develop bronchopleural fistulas so both of those can cause air to to collect within the pleural effusion there so a hallmark of empyema on ct is the split pleura sign so here we have a loculated pleural effusion with thickening and enhancement of the parietal and the visceral pleura so that is the split pleura sign so that can be associated with empyema it does not always mean empyema it does mean though that you have an exudative effusion rather than a transudative effusion occasionally metastatic disease might also give you a split pleura sign and sometimes you can have exudative effusions that don't necessarily represent empyema that can also give you a split pleura sign we can also have air that uh, collects within the pleural effusion often uh, that air although it can be from gas forming bacteria but more often this is caused by bronchopleural fistula and often these communications are small and they close spontaneously so you may see a little bit of air like that within the uh, empyema <clears throat> the treatment of empyema is with chest tube drainage as in this example large effusion there drained with a chest tube now when we have air fluid levels within empyema it's important to differentiate that from a lung abscess so an empyema or a pleural collection has a lenticular shape smooth walls usually less than five millimeters thick uniformly enhancing wall that compresses adjacent lung and we have obtuse angles with the chest wall as opposed to a lung abscess which is round in shape so the size of the air fluid level will be the same on frontal and lateral views as opposed to an empyema where the where the length of that air, air fluid level will change uh, between the frontal and lateral views lung abscesses can have a thick irregular wall which may give you non-uniform enhancement and lung abscess destroys the lung and uh, these will have acute angles with the chest wall so an empyema conforms to the shape of the pleural space lung abscess is round has thicker walls destroys the lung tissue and there are acute angles here where it comes up against the chest wall so here's a patient with empyema we can see the marked thickening here of the pleural surfaces there's a patient with loculated pleural effusion also demonstrated nicely here on the coronal image well this patient gets a chest tube but the lung does not re-expand so what's happening here well a clue is notice the thickening of the parietal pleural surface but also thickening here along the visceral pleural margin so this is a patient who has a trap lung so this is a visceral peel a chronic uh, pleural peel that is formed here as a result of this uh, empyema and so this then presents the lung from expanding we call that a trapped lung here we have extensive calcification of the pleura indicating extensive fibrosis here within the pleura what is this called this is called a fibrothorax so fibrothorax is when we have extensive pleural thickening that can be associated with ipsilateral volume loss and ventilatory impairment so this can result uh, secondary to uh, as a complication of hemorrhagic effusions commonly after pyogenic empyema especially tuberculosis and can also occur from asbestos pleurisy all of these can give you fibrotic change within the pleura thickening 
and might also calcify, resulting in fibrothorax. So with fibrothorax, we'll have thickened pleura with calcification, and that can actually make the lung smaller on that side and impair ventilation on that side. So uh, if there is ventilatory impairment, often the vessels on that side will be decreased in size on the CT from redistribution of blood flow. Here we see extensive pleural calcification and actually some decrease in volume and some little bit of paucity of vasculature there at the left lung base. Now, if I ask the question, is this a pulmonary or extra pulmonary lesion? Well, how can we decide? The first thing is we decide what is the center of the mass. If we put the center of the mass right here, then we notice that this is indeed located within the lung parenchyma as opposed to the pleura. Then we look at the angles. This seems to have acute angle here. So here we would think of a pulmonary mass as opposed to an extra pulmonary mass. So pulmonary lesion is centered in the lung. It forms acute angles with the chest wall and engulfs pulmonary vessels as opposed to an extra pulmonary lesion as in this example here. So here we have a nice example of the incomplete border sign where you're missing the lateral border of this lesion uh, because it is in contact with the chest wall and pleural surface. And you have obtuse angles here at the margins with the chest wall and this will cause displacement of blood vessel. So here we have a lesion with a disappearing border sign. So when we see that, we should think of pleural base lesions. So in our differential of uh, pleural lesions, we can think of loculated pleural fluid, we can think of metastatic disease, but a very common lesion uh, that can also occur in the pleura, and actually this is the most common benign pleural tumor, is a lipoma. And we see this one is actually extending into the chest wall in this particular example. So a lipoma is the most common benign pleural or chest wall tumor. It arises from subpleural adipose tissue. We have a focal pleural mass on the chest radiograph. We might see that disappearing border. And on CT, it's an easy diagnosis because we have fatty attenuation there within the lesion. So when we're talking about these pleural masses, the classic chest X-ray appearance, sharp medial border, convex towards the lung, obtuse angles at the periphery, and the disappearing border sign where the lesion contacts the pleura. So if we look at this example, again, we have a pleural lesion. Well, what do we think here? When we're dealing with these kind of lesions, some questions you want to ask yourself is, do we think that this is benign or malignant? Are there any signs of malignancy? And the most important thing to, to look for when you have a lesion that is touching the chest wall is look for rib destruction. And if we look carefully here, we can see this rib clearly. We can see this rib clearly. but portion of this rib appears destroyed. And given that finding here, we would put metastatic disease, neoplasm, possibly uh, myeloma or plasmocytoma if it's an isolated lesion high on the differential diagnosis. And here on the CT, we can see rib destruction here in this lesion. And this was an example of multiple myeloma here causing an expansile lesion in the rib in this case. Another example here, where we have this peripheral lesion with disappearing border sign. It's very important to look also at the anterior ribs. We're pretty good at looking at posterior ribs. But when we look at the anterior ribs here, we can see this one, we can see this one, we can see this one, we can see this one. This one down here we can see, but this one is missing. So again, we have a lesion that is causing rib destruction. This was a metastatic lesion here to the anterior rib in this particular case. So, and you can see additional evidence of metastatic disease uh, within the vertebral body. So it's very important here to look at the ribs, both the posterior and anterior ribs, whenever you have a lesion like uh, uh, that has a disappearing border uh, that may be uh, touching the pleural surface or may be originating actually from the chest wall. Another example where we have what appears to be a pleural lesion, well, what do we think is the cause here? If we look carefully, we can see that there is a fracture here within that rib. So here we would think of a trauma. So there's acute trauma. So then that is a hematoma there within the, uh, within the pleural space. So a pleural hematoma can be associated with trauma and rib fractures. Now, what about this case? 
So here we have a case involved in a patient involved in trauma. We see a pleural effusion here, but this is a high attenuation collection here. So do we think that is a hemothorax or do we think this is something else? Well, in these cases of trauma, it's also important to look for this, this little fat stripe that is displaced. This is extra pleural fat that is displaced, which tells you that this is an extra pleural hematoma. So when we have that displaced pleural line here, here, and often associated with rib fractures, as in this case, and then here on the coronal reconstruction, you can see very nicely, here is the displaced extra pleural fat line. So this collection is not in the pleural space. It's actually outside of the pleural space. That is an extra pleural hematoma. So extra pleural hematomas can occur as a result of injury to the internal mammary or intercostal vessels without disruption of the parietal pleura that is so commonly associated with rib fractures. So this results in bleeding into the extra pleural space, gives you a high attenuation collection that displaces the extra pleural fat inward with that extra pleural fat sign. If these are convex to the lung, then we might think about arterial bleeding and uh, that will not be drained with a chest tube because the chest tube goes into the pleural space. So here it might require embolization to control the bleeding. On the other hand, if it is not convex, then maybe it is from venous bleeding. So it's very important to discern the presence of an extra pleural hematoma. And we look for that with this sign, the displaced extra pleural fat when we have an extra pleural hematoma. So here again, why in a chest lecture would I be showing you a bone film? We notice again, we have what appears to be a pleural base lesion. On the bones, we have this cortical thickening here of the tibia, the long bones, tibia and fibula. So there is periostitis there. How do we put that together with, the, with a pleural lesion? Well, uh, this is the appearance of a solitary fibrous tumor within the pleura associated with a particular paraneoplastic syndrome, hypertrophic uh, osteoarthropathy. So what's happening here on the CT scan, we have a pleural lesion, it's a different case. So we have a pleural lesion here that is enhancing on the CT. Here uh, on MR, it is, does enhance after gadolinium. Notice the T1 and the T2 weighted images here. What is the clue that this is a fibrous lesion well, usually neoplasms are bright, <clears throat> have increased signal intensity on T2-weighted imaging, but this lesion is dark on T2, which tells you it has a high fibrous content. So think of what lyomyomas look like on MRs of the pelvis, lyomyomas of the uterus there. So this tumor has high fibrous content, so that is our clue that we are dealing with a fibrous pleural tumor. So these are called pleural fibromas, fibrous mesotheliomas, used to be called benign mesotheliomas, although they're not always benign. So this is not related to asbestos exposure, and 80% arise from the visceral pleura, 20% arise from the parietal pleura. 14 to 30% of these tumors can be malignant. The larger the lesion, the more you would be concerned about malignancy. These can be pedunculated with broad-based attachments, and these can be associated with hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, seen about in 35% of cases, and can also be associated with hypoglycemia. So these tumors can elicit an insulin-like substance, and that can result in hypoglycemia. These tumors can also arise from the visceral pleura, as in this example here. This one is within the fissure. So this was also a fibrous pleural tumor here arising along the major fissure from the visceral pleura. So these tumors can give you round or lobulated pleural mass appearance on the chest radiograph. Slow growing can change positions if pedunculated and can also arise within the fissures as in this example that we have seen. Sometimes they can be calcified. The larger the tumor, the more you would be concerned about malignancy. Here's a case where the tumor is actually growing right on top of the diaphragm. This was a large fibrous pleural tumor. Looks like an elevated diaphragm on the chest radiograph there. But here the tumor clearly can delineate that from the, uh, from the atelectatic lung. Now what about this case? Again, we have a pleural lesion. 
We look on the CT, it seems to be solid, so this is not loculated fluid. So we've talked about the possibility of a metastatic disease, fibrous pleural tumor, what else could this be? Well, another structure that runs alongside the ribs, uh, we also have nerves that run alongside the ribs and we can have tumors arise from the nerves too. This was a neurofibroma. So occasionally neurofibroma can also give you the appearance of a pleural mass. So this is our differential diagnosis for a solid pleural density. And you should be familiar with, uh, with the entities that are on this list. So let's move on. So our next case here, we have a loculated pleural effusion here, some thickened pleura. So what could this be from? Notice also the clue here. This is a non-contrast CT. So here we have calcification of the diaphragmatic pleural surface telling us that this patient has had asbestos exposure. So this is an asbestos related pleural effusion. Another, uh, another finding we can get from asbestos exposure, these are calcified pleural plaques that we are looking at on FOSS. Sometimes if these are small and you don't notice they're calcified, these can also mimic, this can also mimic metastatic disease within the chest. Here's something else that we can see, diffuse pleural thickening here. Looks like it is actually making this lung smaller than the other side. So when we see that kind of circumferential diffuse pleural thickening, we need to think about neoplasm. This is mesothelioma, which can also be associated with asbestos exposure. And here we see that uh, large pleural mass here and pleural thickening extending to the mediastinal pleural surface. And this one is actually invading the chest wall. Now, what about this? Here we have a lesion here. We can see on the lateral chest radiograph. And then here on the CT, a kind of a characteristic appearance of this comet tail sign, the pleural thickening. Notice also the major fissure here is pulled down. So there is volume loss. This is the appearance of rounded atelectasis, which can also be associated with asbestos related pleural disease. So these are all examples of abnormalities we can see with asbestos. We can have benign effusions, pleural thickening, pleural plaques, pleural calcification, rounded atelectasis, asbestosis, and then of course neoplasms that can also be associated with asbestos exposure. So with asbestos, we have these different types of fibers. These fibers are needle-like. So when they are inhaled, they can penetrate all the way out to the pleural surface. And that's what can give us the pleural changes that we can see associated with asbestosis. Also within the lung, we have macrophages uh, that try to ingest the fibers and they die releasing their enzymes. And that also contributes to the fibrosis that we can see within the lung parenchyma and also within the pleural space associated with uh, exposure to asbestos. Benign asbestos pleural effusion, that's the most common abnormality we can see within 10 years of asbestos exposure. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. You want a history of asbestos exposure, no other cause for the effusion, no malignancy within three years of onset of the effusion. So usually these are small effusions, can be exudative and blood tinge, unilateral, bilateral, can be recurrent. And patients can develop uh, pleural thickening. Uh, as a sequela here. So with a benign asbestos effusion, you can have loculated effusions here, pleural thickening. Uh, but the clue, uh, if you have it, it can be helpful. The clue of asbestos exposure, in this case, we have the calcified pleural plaque. These diaphragmatic calcified plaques are very characteristic of asbestos exposure. Pleural thickening can also occur as a sequela of the effusion, uh, can obliterate the costophrenic angle, often smooth and uh, if it gets extensive enough, can cause physiological impairment. So we have some smooth pleural thickening as a sequela of asbestos exposure. There's a definition of diffuse pleural thickening CT criteria greater than eight centimeters in cranial cortical extent, greater than five centimeters wide, greater than three centimeters thick. So this can cause physiological impairment if we develop diffuse pleural thickening um, from asbestos exposure. Pleural plaques, also very common from asbestos exposure, 20 year latency period. You can have focal areas of nodular or irregular pleural thickening. Easily, you can easily mistake these for nodules or metastatic disease there. 
uh, usually involves the parietal pleura and also characteristically the pleura over the diaphragm. The apices and costophrenic angles are spared. So often we can see these plaques very close to the ribs, kind of related to the ribs and over the diaphragmatic surface. So that's the location of these pleural plaques. And plaques over the diaphragmatic surface are also very characteristic of asbestos-related pleural plaques. So again, these spare the costophrenic angles and the lung apices. So this appearance of calcified here, we have calcified pleural plaques, and sometimes they can look nodular as in this example. So that's a typical appearance for pleural plaques from exposure to asbestos. And we can also have pleural calcification from exposure to asbestos. Also, when we look at these calcified pleural plaques on FOSS, they may look like a holly leaf called the holly leaf sign of these calcified pleural plaques. Now we can have more extensive calcification as in, as in this example here. There's a differential for pleural calcification. We can see this with old hemothorax, chronic empyeme, especially tuberculosis. And this can also occur as a complication of asbestos-related pleural disease. TAC pleurodesis can also give you high attenuation within the pleural space. That tends to look more granular on CT, so that does not look, uh, that does not usually give you or, or typically give you this kind of extensive pleural calcification. Rounded atelectasis. So, We've seen what, uh, what that looks like, pleural base mass, abnormal pleura, so it's based on an area of pleural thickening. Doesn't have to be from asbestos. Anything that gives you pleural thickening might result in rounded atelectasis, but rounded atelectasis is quite common or occurs commonly in a, associated with asbestos-related pleural disease. So abnormal pleura, comet tail sign, and volume loss. Again, notice the major fissure here is depressed. So volume loss within the lobe, also a finding associated with rounded atelectasis. Now, do not confuse the terminology here when we talk about asbestos-related pleural disease with asbestosis. So asbestosis is when we have fibrosis in the lung parenchyma associated with asbestos exposure. So here we, we can have reticular opacities, honeycombing, as in this example. So this is interstitial lung disease associated with asbestos exposure. What is the most common neoplasm associated with asbestos exposure? Well, the answer is bronchogenic carcinoma. So that is the most common neoplasm associated with asbestos exposure. So here's a here's an example. Uh, there's a cancer there in the left lower lobe, and this patient clearly has calcified pleural plaques from asbestos exposure. Is another example, cancer in the right lower lobe, and again, calcified pleural plaques here from asbestos exposure. Malignant mesothelioma can also be associated with asbestos exposure. This also has a long latency period, so this can give you nodular pleural thickening, especially pleural thickening that encases the lung and extends to the mediastinal pleural surface. Whenever we have pleural thickening extending to the mediastinal pleural surface, we need to consider malignancy. So we've seen this case before where we have this extensive pleural thickening encasing the lung. And here's another example where we have pleural thickening here and also some mediastinal abnormality as a result of the pleural thickening extending to the mediastinal pleural surface. So this can make the lung look small on a chest radiograph. So if we have circumferential pleural thickening, we need to think of neoplasm. So circumferential nodular pleural thickening with involvement of the mediastinal pleura, if we see that, we need to think neoplasm, especially mesothelioma, although metastatic disease might also give you that appearance. Not all cases will have evidence of asbestos exposure when you look at the pleural surfaces though. So the fact that you don't have calcified pleural plaques, that does not mean that you exclude mesothelioma. The differential is metastatic tumor. Here's an example of metastatic adenocarcinoma also giving you circumferential pleural thickening. Here's an example of colon cancer, metastatic disease to the liver. And again, we have this nodular pleural thickening here on this side with pleural effusion. So metastatic disease is in your differential for something that looks like mesothelioma. And here we have, we've seen this case of invasion of the chest wall, which can occur with mesothelioma. Here's a case where the patient presented with a large pleural effusion 
collapse of the lung. Notice though, when we look at the pleural surfaces, there is pleural thickening here and pleural thickening of the mediastinal pleural surface. If we see that, we need to consider malignancy. This was mesothelioma presenting as a large pleural effusion. So other things mesothelioma can do, it can invade the chest wall. Have we seen it can invade the diaphragm? Here it is extending into the liver. It can give you lymphadenopathy. It can also involve the pericardium. There, there's a pericardial effusion in that, in that case of mesothelioma there. So differentiating benign from malignant pleural thickening. Benign thickening, usually less than a centimeter thick, smooth, does not involve the entire pleura. The, does not encase the lung. The mediastinal pleura is usually spare. Malignant pleural thickening greater than a centimeter tends to be nodular, circumferential, and there is mediastinal pleural involvement. Now, what rare disease can be associated with these findings? We have these sclerotic lesions within the long bones. We have this uh, pleural thickening here and some pleural effusion. And also in the retroperitheum, we have this circumferential thickening of the soft tissue surrounding the kidneys. This is an example of Erdheim-Chester disease, a rare multisystemic disorder classified as a non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis. These patients have xanthomatous infiltration of organs by foamy lipid-laden histiocytes. Most patients have bone involvement with symmetric long bone sclerosis, uh, often involving the distal femoral metadiaphyses. And extraosseous disease can occur in half of the patients that can affect nearly all organs, including the lungs and retroperitoneum. So pulmonary involvement, this gives you symmetric circumferential pleural thickening with effusions and smooth interlobular septal thickening. And occasionally you may have pericardial thickening and central lobular nodules. This can be quite characteristic, this retroperitoneal involvement with circumferential soft tissue encasement of the kidneys and sometimes the aorta. So that is Erdheim-Chester disease. So consider that in patients with pleural or pericardial soft tissue thickening with perirenal soft tissue encasement and this symmetric sclerotic lesions within the long bones. Okay, now what about this case? This patient has multiple pleural nodules. These nodules are enhancing. The clue is on the last image though. What is missing here is the spleen. So here we would think of splenosis. So thoracic splenosis, this occurs uh, in patients who have a history of trauma. So these patients have uh, had injury to the spleen, injury to the diaphragm. So the shattered spleen, fragments of the spleen go through the injured diaphragm and implant with it within the pleural space. When the spleen is removed, then these implants can grow and that gives you thoracic splenosis. This only occurs on the left side. For definitive diagnosis, sulfur colloid or technetium red blood cell scan, and it shows you the active splenic tissue here within the chest. So that is, the, uh, that is pathomonic for thoracic splenosis if we see that. So this is our differential for multiple pleural densities. So these are the lesions that we have discussed. So let's move on. Here we have a 32-year-old woman. What are the findings here? We see a pneumothorax and we also see this pleural nodule. Well, how do we put this together? We have a pleural nodule here in a young woman with a pneumothorax. And we can see the pleural nodules here on the CT. We can see the pneumothorax pretty clearly. Here's the pleural nodules. What's your differential diagnosis for a pneumothorax and right-sided pleural lesions here within a young female? Well, we discussed before metastatic disease. Osteosarcoma can be associated with the nodules, metastatic disease, and pneumothorax. You'd want to know as the patient had a biopsy, of course, maybe this is a result of an iatrogenic procedure. But in this case, especially when we're dealing with a uh, young woman, we need to think of catamenial pneumothorax. So catamenial pneumothorax, recurrent right-sided pneumothorax during menses in a woman of reproductive age from thoracic endometriosis. So what happens is, is that the peritoneal fluid, 
preferentially deposits this ectopic endometrial tissue under the right diaphragm. And this can get access because of connections between the pleural space, especially on the right side, and the peritoneum. So some of that endometrial tissue can get into the pleural space, erodes the visceral pleura, causing pneumothorax. So up to a third of recurrent spontaneous pneumothoraces in women of reproductive age referred for surgery uh, can be as a result of catamenial pneumothorax. Right-sided in 90% of cases, coexistent endometrial, coexistent abdominal endometriosis in 60 to 80% of cases. And these patients can present with right-sided scapular or thoracic pain from 24 hours before to 72 hours after the onset of menses. CT may show these pleural nodules representing these endometrial implants there along the pleural surfaces. So if the diagnosis is unclear, the patient may undergo VATS. VATS can show the characteristic nodular brown lesions there uh, on the, uh, along the diaphragm or the diaphragmatic holes that allow the endometrial tissue to get access to the pleural space. Goals of therapy, suppression or elimination of endometrial implants with hormonal uh, manipulation and resection with closure of the diaphragmatic holes. All right, so let's move on. What do we think of this case? Well, this patient has this marked elevation of the left diaphragm. Is this eventration of the diaphragm or is this paralysis of the diaphragm? How do we tell them apart? On CT, it just shows you the elevated diaphragm. So uh, that can tell you that it's not a diaphragmatic hernia, but still does not help us differentiate eventration from paralysis of the diaphragm. For, for that, we do the sniff test. So this is under fluoroscopy. We ask the patient to sniff rapidly and we look for a paradoxical motion of the diaphragm. Notice the right diaphragm moves down when the patient is sniffing, but the left diaphragm has this paradoxical upward motion and that is diagnostic then of paralysis of the diaphragm. Here on the lateral view, when we have both diaphragms superimposed, the patient sniffs, we can see the downward motion of the right diaphragm, but there is the paradoxical upward motion of the left diaphragm, telling us that this person has a paralyzed left diaphragm. Okay, so that is our discussion of pleural disease. I thank you for your attention, and we will see you next time.